Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Record Club, where each week, one of us chooses the record for the other people to listen to. And then we talk about it in a review-like format. Indeed. This week, Tyler has chosen Yo La Tango and their album, I Can Hear the Heart Beating as One. Indeed. Yo La Tango are a... As, as much as you can have such a thing as an indie rock legacy act at this point, then Yola Tingo would be that. They have been Notable going... for releasing, re- releasing 10 million albums. Well, they've been going strong for, I think, like something like 35 years. Actually, no, they've been going strong for, I'd be even more specific than that, 37 years. They formed in 1984. And they gradually built up a discography that has become one of the most widely respected, one of the most critically adored, and one of the most consistently excellent, in my humble opinion, of all of, you know, classic indie rock. And as much as you classic indie rock can be a thing, then Yola Tengo are a part of it. And there is a very special reason why, well, there's a few reasons why I chose this for us to review. This is my last Richard Club choice of the year. And as I have alluded to, if not outright referenced in my previous record clubs this year, a large theme of my record club suggestions this year has been albums that have meant a lot to me growing up, albums that have kind of like fundamentally altered or had some kind of impact on my taste in music, my musical development, what I appreciate. We've talked about albums such as Orbitals Inside. We've talked about albums like Modest Mouse's The Lonesome Crowd of West. We talked about Broken Social Scenes, You Forgot It and People. We talked about Los Campesinos, Hold On Now, Youngster. The Dismemberment Plans, Emergency and I also. All of these albums that are kind of in my informal series of like canonical me records growing up. Many of them unified by that indie rock format. And when we think about like classic, when I think about classic indie rock, I think about the bands that defined the nineties for post sort of, you know, post the explosive expansive era of blown out over the top rock music that defined the eighties, the nineties came to be defined by bands like pavement, by bands like built to spill by bands like modest mouse by bands like, the band we're discussing today, Yola Tengo. They had a string of um, the kind of the most critically and commercially renowned records in the 90s from 93 through to 2000. Uh, those being Painful, Electro Pura. Uh, this record, I Can Hear the Heart Beating as one, and, and Then Nothing Turned Itself Inside Out being the last of those. Um, but they've had many great records beyond that point. Very underrated albums like Summer Sun, like Popular Songs, like Fade, and of course, the immortally titled uh, I Am Not Afraid of You and I Will Beat Your Ass. <laughs> a, a, a very dynamic band. And what, what a part of why Yola Tengo have been so enduring and why they've been so continually respected is what a versatile band they are as well. Like when you think of indie rock, if I tell you, think about an indie rock album right now, you will probably think of a record that sounds a very particular way, has like distorted guitars and sort of like alti vocals and, you know, fits within a particular mold. And what's always been beautiful about Yola Tengo has been how much they have played with I mean, I don't even know if they would consider themselves an indie rock band. They probably consider themselves a pop band with the way that they work, but they are not restricted to a particular kind of niche with regards to expression. They're a very fundamentally fundamentals band, just singer slash guitarist, drummer, and bassist. Worth noting that the co-front people of this band Ira Kaplan and Georgia Hubley are married and have been married for the entire time that Yola Tengo has been a band and so the two things that have kind of defined the dynamic of this band one is the what I've already mentioned the kind of versatility they're not just an indie rock band they write pop songs that are very clearly and heavily influenced by like 50s and 60s pop they are one of the all-time great shoegaze bands they're sometimes a fantastic noise jam band They can write beautifully simple, elegant. I mean, there's a fucking bossa nova song on this album, for Christ's sake. 
they're incredibly versatile but the other thing that kind of defines Yola Tengo is the dynamic between Ira Kaplan and George Hubley the husband and wife duo that trade vocals within this band on every album and that essentially defined the kind of like homely, welcoming vibe of Yola Tengo. To me, they're a very comforting band to listen to, even when they're making like ear scraping noise for upwards of 10, 15 minutes on their albums. They find a way to do that. That's warm, that's welcoming, that becomes hypnotic and beautiful. Like you have some of the most gorgeous pop songs I've ever heard on this album. And yes, I would call them pop songs. And some of them are screechingly loud and others of them are, you know, breathtakingly quiet and serene and all the things in between. What makes I Can Hear the Heart Beating, Beating as One, the definitive Yola Tengo album, is how expertly and almost effortlessly they construct classical songs or instant classic indie rock songs in all of these different styles that they're able to inhabit. Um, yeah, they're a band that mean a tremendous amount to me. And this is, of course, the first album I ever heard from them. The album that's always connected with me the most, as much as I love their other records. Um, they're definitely one of my favorite bands of all time. And they have no shortage of records I absolutely adore. But this is the one where I, every time I put this on from front to back, I am spellbound. There's not a second where this record flags or loses me. And it's strange to say that because, you know, if you think about conventionally all the things that make a good album construction, I mean, this is hardly like the most consistent with an aesthetic. Like there's, there can be sharp variation from one song to the next. Like if you think of Damage into Deeper into Movies, two completely opposite sounding songs, yet the holistic portrait of this album, and a lot of it is helped by its length, which, and it is a long album, feels like this world of various different sounds that Yola Tengo inhabit and they can you know travel from one place in this world to another and it feels like you're getting this round trip of the world and not just you know randomly ending up in certain places you're you're you're, you're progressing through these different musical ideas and recircling back to earlier ones and it has this beautiful feeling of forward momentum to it the whole way through um yeah i love this record so much and august you've developed a kind of close attachment to this band uh, to a certain extent anyway in recent months um probably in no small part prompted by my own effusive praise but why don't you i'd love to hear from you at this point about you know you've you've spoken about it on the podcast but i think for this episode it would be good to sort of revisit how you got into this band your relationship with this band so far and this record in particular um so yola tango were a band i i first got into just because i i mean obviously you had been talking about them a lot and i was really intrigued by just their outward kind of strictly surface level aesthetic of like their album covers their titling and, and the way they presented everything they did and the first album i listened to from them was painful and that record uh, that's its own thing very dark atmospheric and as you say on the other hand loud and abrasive so, you know, I, I got into that album that way and then kind of started to move through their discography as you do. And this was kind of the next, this album was kind of the next natural progression point for me, just because it was their most lauded record. And a lot of my attachment from Yola Tango to Lo Yola Tango has come from the fact that just how much joy I get from revisiting their highlights because this is a band who because of their versatility never fail to bring a smile to my face because of how how they can weave one idea into another across their their records and then and it still feels 
because I, initially my hurdle with this band was that I didn't think they were cohesive. And that was a bit of a turnoff being a big structure whore myself. But as you listen to it, you find that cohesion in just the emotional tone and the presentation and production of ideas, even if they are conveyed through different lenses. And, and what really makes them stand out to me as an indie rock band is that 60s, 50s influence, some of which I think comes from Ira Kaplan being about 10 years older than most of his contemporaries and having that age and growing up in a very different musical atmosphere where what he is, what, what this band and him and his wife are presenting on this al on these songs and albums are less refutations to the previous decade of music and more nostalgic recalls to their childhood where they came from which gives such a comforting nostalgic overall feel to the band which is just mm. intoxicating i find you and i have talked about this a lot august that yola tingo are a band where you put the music on and it's like it, it, it trends i'm trying to find a way of expressing this that isn't like use cliches or corny language but like it transports you or it, the mo the t places where you are and the times in your life where you are where you experience this music it becomes irrevocably tied to that and when you as you kind of age and experience and revisit this music like the revisiting I think is so key like the coming back to this music it acquires a certain power through its presence in your life and through the sense in which its ambiance its kind of atmospheric sort of nature becomes like a part of the fabric of your memory and if that makes any sort of sense like they the, these songs root themselves in your brain and then they become like these little fragments of comforting nostalgia that can bring you back to a particular place where you were when you first heard them or they can take you to a place earlier in your life long before you even knew that the band existed they're able to th there's something so comforting and warm and transportative about their music even when it's being squallingly mm. loud that wraps you up in a kind of cocoon I think one thing that makes the band that one of the reasons why the band are so easily able to do this is that this isn't a band that writes sort of complex arrangements these aren't songs that have like lots and lots of moving parts maybe the most complicated song I guess on a construction standpoint of this record might be Moby Octopad but for the most part this record is like these songs are elementally simple there's oh, yeah. not a lot of layers that are going on there's just very simple things there's a drum beat that's usually quite consistent there's a really warm bass line or bass texture courtesy of james mcnew who is such an important part of this band's sound oh, and there is and he's so good also it, yeah. it needs to be said that his he is like despite obviously not being a a like part of this husband and wife duo he he has such a natural chemistry with this band that is such a part of their sound. Yeah, I, I, I'm imagining Ira and Georgia like in the early 90s because they were a band in this band for a while before James joined, like seeing him being like, my wife and I saw you from across the bar. And we yeah. Really, we really like your vibe. We like, like your energy. We want to know if you want to join our seminal indie rock band. Um, mm. <laughs> Uh, anyway yeah he's so important he's you're right he's so important and it's not just like you think about the great bass players what's often the reason why they're so important is because you know the they add so much to the rhythm section of the band like the the rhythm section of a rock band is so important but james what james does it's not so much about setting a rhythmic backbone for these songs but he is like the textural king like his bass playing sets is so much a part of the atmospheric fabric of these songs and what makes them so immersive. Just as much as Ira's very kind of like often distorted and noisy guitar playing. And it's, the relationship between Ira and 
James as players and then Georgia, who is the drummer, is super, super, super important to the effect of these songs. It, it's the hypnotic quality that the loping bass motifs or just general tones create. It's the hypnotic quality of Ira Kaplan's guitar soloing and just general walls of sound. I think he's one of the great soloists of all time. You don't get a heap of them on this particular album, but when his solos do show up on tracks like We're an American Band or one of my favorite little solos of all time which is so like easy to overlook but the solo in Stockholm Syndrome absolutely just fucking tears through my flesh and brain little whereas it's not always solos like you have a song like Sugar Cube one of if not the greatest shoegaze song of all time in my opinion yeah um, yes. or at it least knows. like the greatest example of shoegaze being whittled into a pop song ever and it's just, uh, and that's not about soloing. That's just about like creating a wall of guitar sound and modulating that and finding the most gorgeous heart rending melodies within it, rendering those through these waves of noise and then adding those vocals as a counterpoint. And to me, the Yola Tingo sound, if it, if it were to be distilled into one thing, it is the counterpoint between a wall of guitar distortion and the just friendly, low-key vocal tones of Ira and Georgia, who will often harmonize each other. And it, it's just, there's something about the way that those two disparate, completely different things combine regularly in Yola Tingo's music that makes it for me, that defines the intangible emotional quality to this music i don't know if that makes any sense or if any of you kind of resonate with the things that i'm saying but there's every time i put this record on it's just i, I it's an overwhelmingly emotional experience for me and, and i can't even really pinpoint why i mean there are emotional songs on this album i mean songs like damage for instance which is a kind of heart-rending sort of song about you know someone who you used to be a really big part of your life kind of fading from your memory and from your awareness or you have really tender love songs like um autumn sweeter for instance which is i think one of the greatest indie rock songs of all time and certainly one of the great indie love songs ever written or whether you have genuinely one of the best little pop songs of all time which is George's solo turn on shadows which is just the most perfect little thing ever like a heartbreaking little song about like you know being about introversion and about happiness and isolation which forms this beautiful counterpoint with other songs that are about you know the sadness of being alone like these are definitely deeply melancholic songs. Don't get me wrong. That, that is a, a thread that runs through this whole album. And I mean, no wonder Teenage Me gravitated so heavily towards it. I was primed to dig into this. I mean, I think the time when I got into Yola Tingo, I think the band I was listening to the most at that time was Bright Eyes of all things. And I just like, the the this is a much more kind of like melancholic band than Bright Eyes kind of sensational melodrama of like emo emotion, but still the thread of that melancholy collie that I was attracted to. I first checked out Yellow Tango last year when I listened to And Then Nothing and Painful. And I really like both of those records. Um, and Then Nothing probably being my favorite Yellow Tango album I've heard so far. And I was just kind of taken with how unique their sound was and how like just how many different genres and styles it all drew from, but it always created this very consistent moody atmospheric and jangly nocturnal kind of vibe and i fuck with that um they're not they're a band i haven't really fully fallen in love with and i'm not sure if that's a because i just you know they're you know well, some bands are just like that you just can be like yeah there's the records of theirs are great but they're not like a favorite um but i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that i just haven't listened to them enough and like you said tyler you just kind of have to let these still with you you know you just carry them with you and let them soundtrack your life a little bit and uh, I think the closest I have to that is probably and then nothing um, and for whatever reason I just kind of put off listening to this one I guess because it was their biggest or most popular album and I was just trying to build to it and upon listening to it you know and my opinion hasn't changed since is that I think it's just as good as those other two records um, 
I'm not sure where exactly I would rank it amongst them or which one is my favorite. Again, I can only semi-confidently say that and then nothing is mine, but I think the it's really easy to see why this is sort of the canon classic from the album just because of how it's a bit vague, but like there's a lot of things on here that just instantly feel iconic which is very strange just because of how low key and you know how you know obviously it's not like this is a pop album that everybody's heard before it's not something that a lot of people would you know deem worthy iconography of but there are just lots of moments here that feel so careful and well designed and the way it all flows together is uh you know it's remarkable it, it's it's the yola tango is an is a band sort of capitalized on my favorite thing about music and that's atmosphere and this is like a really heavy dense atmosphere but without ever truly being overwhelming to the point of discomfort um it doesn't shy away from darkness or what have you but it's very much in the moment about being alive and experiencing something on a very raw level um there are I will say that this is maybe the most of the three albums. I have them all rated similarly. This for me is maybe the most uneven, uh, which is a relative term. Uh, it's not exactly like it ever like dips in quality substantially, but there are just stretches and runs on this album that has a lot of songs that I just really gravitate to towards a little bit more than the others. The others feel a little bit more sweet like to me, whereas the more fully formed song approach here can lead to me being uh, more comparatively like, oh my God, this is amazing compared to, oh, that was really, really good. Um, but that said, I mean, it's easy to see why this is held in the esteem that it is. And it's obvious as to why you, Tyler, love it. I mean, it's such a like, I feel like if you never even told me, I'd listen to this and be like, yeah, this is Tyler core. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, comparatively warm album it's uh it's very inviting it's very comforting and i think that that's sort of the main appeal of it it's just an album that's really easy to listen to and enjoy but it doesn't sacrifice that by being like brief or insubstantial or anything it's it's fully committing to this and it shows you that there's artistry in that there's a lot of people who in music they kind of dismiss atmosphere or the sort of vague kind of otherworldly feeling that some music can give you as being something that's like subjective or you know it, it's not worth talking about or or it's just something that like you know purely comes from people and not from the music but yola tango feel like they're dedicated to that and making that an art form in and of itself and that i really really respect about them what has always struck me about this album is just how timeless most of the songs on here feel they feel like songs that have existed forever. Like they, they feel like songs that are like existing in real time, and you're just kind of seeing a, a snapshot of this continuous song that is ex perpetually existing. Like I don't know if that makes any sense. It's certainly more true of their jammier tracks, I guess, than the more kind of conventionally structured pop songs. But like yeah. tracks like Return to Hot Chicken, tracks like uh, Deeper into Movies, tracks like Green Arrow, tracks like Speck Bebop, those all feel like you're just kind of observing the existence of this breathing thing for a brief period, for a period of time that the band decide is enough but it you you get the feeling that like it continues existing or that it was edited down from like hours and hours of of music um and there's a feeling to that of like wandering through rooms or like wandering through like there's a dream like actually when i listen to this album because I, i've probably listened to this in full at least 50 times in my life when i listen to it it has the feeling like with that you know moving from style to style and that kind of what I've, what jake termed i think fairly unevenness because that's not inherently a negative it's just a description of of the variation in tone and and as a result of that the extent to which certain people might respond to parts of it more than others but like to me to me it has the feeling of like a, a being in a it's a dreamlike feeling and like you're wandering through different kind of rooms in a dream or different kind of emotional states or aesthetic representations of feeling within a dream and the the actual dreamy in quotation marks tones of the guitars as well definitely aids that to a certain extent there's something that happens to my brain and my body 
when I hit play and return to hot chicken kind of just drifts into existence. And it's this very unassuming beginning to the record that has this gorgeous sort of loping guitar line passage that again feels like it's just drifting into existence and then drifting out of existence and there's something like welcoming and just homely about that it, it, immediately no matter how I'm feeling I can put this record on that can drift into existence and my heart rate will go down like I it, it just has this sort of calming effect and I think to be fair like if you want a, a purely calming musical experience then maybe something like and then nothing would be a better pick because that is a much more um low-key album on the whole it has less of the noisier moments but there is again and I think Jake you kind of describes it really well when you see this kind of feeling of classic like the there's just things you can't describe why but they just kind of feel eternal or classic or or all time in, in some sense like that's to me what I the feeling feeling I get when I hear a song like Sugar Cube or a song like Shadows or a song like Stockholm Syndrome or Autumn Sweater or fucking this whole goddamn album there's what I like about it is it has a kind of playlisty sort of structure that shouldn't work, but does in the sense that you're drifting between these like pure pop verse chorus verse songs and these kind of jammier longer tracks like deeper into movies and spec bebop where they're just exploring the tonalities and aesthetics of noise and of you know, guitar feedback specifically and its relationship to vocals like a song like deeper into movies for instance like I could see being completely turned off by that song because like aesthetically it's very unusual it's produced and mixed in a kind of quite distant way it has this kind of like squalling wall of distortion that carries through it this absolutely gorgeous as honey bass line that rolls across the whole thing and these vocals that sound like they're recorded in a fucking down the end of a corridor that they're shouting at this mic that's like fucking 20 feet away and I could get finding that completely just whatever washing over you but it's like the intensity of these things and the way they all come together there's something that's so powerful about that in the same way that the pure quietude of damage or shadows is powerful. Like it's just, ah, I hate that I don't really have the words to make that articulate, but it's almost like the kind of album that defies description in that sense. I'd love, I'm sure August, you could probably think of like ways of describing like even whether it's experiences that you've had or just like impressions that the music has given you. It's, it's so hard to, explain why it works sometimes and then other times it's really easy like sugar cube it's a great fucking song it has a great verse, it, verse it structure just, it has a great sort of shoegaze guitar tone that that, that tone yeah it and, has a fucking key change on its bridge at about two minutes in that fucking rips me apart um yeah, yeah that shit is so easy to describe why it works autumn sweater really easy to describe why it works there's it's one of the greatest indie rock songs of all time and it doesn't even have a fucking guitar in it it's just this bathing organ keyboard sound and the bass and the vocals and it's just like and again it's simple but the it's the emotional tone of it and the story that's being told is really really sort of straightforward these images of a of a budding love <coughs> and these you know icons of young love like an autumn sweater or whatever it is that kind of represent that make you feel a certain feeling you associate with a person and then the way that the warmth of that love is reflected and the warmth of the organ tones the shit is magical um and and there's moments like the lie and how we told it where it's like that's barely even a song it's just kind of like the, the how beautiful their vocals are and how gorgeous the guitar sounds for nearly three minutes on end and you just like get to dip into that space and live there for a short time and it's it's like a hug <laughs> i love that i don't know yeah not gonna try and start any fights here uh or anything but i'll so go ahead and lay the groundwork for that like this is the worst complaint to have with an album ever but like when like especially hearing like you and august talk about songs like sugar cube and what have you and like songs that are on here and it's like 
I really enjoy them. I just don't ever really feel that level of transcendence with them. And I don't know if that's my problem or like, I don't like, I don't even think it's the music's problem necessarily. It's just that like, there are like this album super consistent in being like really, really good and really, really enjoyable. And I really like it a lot. Uh, but those like high points for me, they don't really occur that often. And they seem to happen with songs that at least I haven't heard talked about because the early album highlight for me, I think Sugar Cube's a very good song. I, uh, the, I, I definitely don't like it as much as U2, but it's, I, I guess maybe it might be a little on the brief side maybe. And I just kind of wanted it to like, flesh itself out more because of that vibe that it lays down. But for me, the song that I truly like fell in love with is uh, Damage that immediately follows it. Um, to me, that's such a like, it's a very emotionally different tone than the first couple songs. Like the first couple songs have a warmth to them and Damage does also, but it's like the first hint of like darkness or even like melancholy on the record and the way the song paces itself makes it way more akin to I guess my sensibilities like it doesn't sound like it would be out of place on a song like or on an album like painful for instance um but like this is like the perfect balance for me of uh Yola Tango songs of like length density um how the instrumentation complements everything um and yeah I think that that's it's I, that is either my favorite song on the album or the uh, I will say the one like agreed high point that I have uh, with you two is Green Arrow. I yeah, yeah. I mean that's just that's yeah. that's like the song on this album for me. And yes, cosign literally everything about it that has been said, nor and will ever be said. Uh, walking around and just sort of like I remember when I first listened to this, I like sort of it was like a sunset when I was walking out to my car from work and like hearing this and then putting it on in my car and then driving away to it is like it's it's like a flawless experience you get that sort of ambient nature sounds at the very beginning it's really like hypnotic that way and it's like it almost like feels like a field of record recording that just evolves into a song and that's just like that's a, a standout moment in their discography for me that's like one of the fewer songs on here that would make it into the, like my top 10 songs from this band mm. um i think green arrow possibly i mean I, I don't have the data to know but there's a strong chance it's probably the song i've heard the most in my life because uh, I used to put it on repeat when I would go to sleep as a teenager uh, a lot, a lot. And so it would just be playing over and over all night. And I would like come in and out of consciousness with those sounds coming into my ear. And I have so many memories and like associations with this album of like experiences and places where I've been, where I've been listening to this. I can remember exactly where I was the first time I heard this album but specifically that song Damage that you mentioned I was in a van on a school trip coming home and it was late in the afternoon and I heard this album for the first time I'd been like scuba diving all day and I was in a van traveling and I heard this album for the first time it was like 5 p.m in the afternoon and it was in summer and that's the that was like the most one of the most perfect sort of I happened to listen to this for the first time in this context and just it it completely changed everything like I just had a transcendental experience sitting there in this van being taken away by all of this music and songs like Damage really were the moments on this record that I did immediately gravitate to first because of the emotional immediacy but also because of how quite subtly but um tastefully they demonstrate a lot of the different aesthetics of Yola Tengo like it is this really quiet song but it has this quite insistent loping bass line it has this really sort of gentle plucked guitar part and it has these washes of feedback and noise that are just subtle enough to not really like take over the song but there's such a sense of studio atmosphere in it and layers that it, it, even though it's such a minimal song that it becomes quite like enveloping like a whole sort of sonic world and to me a lot of the songs in this record if not all of them are that to me but this song I will agree like is particularly pronounced in the way that it does that and Green Arrow is like just the most sort of 
vividly imagistic song ever recorded maybe like it has no lyrics whatsoever but it perfectly evokes like a a a dusky time of day where you're just kind of like sitting probably near some water but also near Tarsiel Road and there's birds and grass and I don't know it's just like so vivid and it's not even the field recordings in the song it's just the sound of the slide guitar as as some and, and the little bum, 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 drums that come in in the second part of the song there's just something about it that feels like the this is gonna sound super corny but it's like the fucking breathing and beating heart of the fucking earth beneath you it, it just feels like it's it's reaching up into your brain through the music fuck i don't even know what that means but it's provocative and it gets the people going there's definitely like a a naturalistic elemental nature to yola tango's music i find that like there's something like almost spiritual about the way that it feels evocative of nature but like specifically nature that exists uh inhabited by or infringed upon by like humanity as in like an urbanized landscape that like also contains Mm. something natural like it's never like a forest in the middle of nowhere just like it's always like I always think about their music in the context of like walking around outside in my neighborhood this is the reason why the album cover for and then nothing turned itself inside out is my favorite album cover of all time because it's like this whole band distilled into one image And it perfectly captures the sound of that record, but it applies pretty well to the sound of this record too. Like that kind of late sort of night, there's this this bluishness and then everything looks blue and sort of dark, but there's this sense of otherworldliness to this natural kind of domestic place, this natural domestic setting that kind of acquires this sense of like the alien somehow. And you're just kind of like, you're complete, there's no one around, but you can hear the sound of the suburbs, the sound of the city, the sound of electricity, the sound of the fucking, you know, LED lights, everything sensory is just kind of like, ah, it's all in there. And, and somehow Yola Tingo are able to, when I listen to this music and when I put on a song like 1 p.m. again or a song like fucking Deeper Into Movies or a song like Moby Octopad or a song like We're an American Band or a song like Speak Bebop, when I put these on, I, in my head are just the, I, I'm, I'm in this, I'm taken to this p- location, this version of the suburbs that feels like this dreamlike nighttime version where there's no human beings around but I'm just, I have a heightened awareness of everything. It, it definitely reminds me of places like it on this, but like there's a song on The World is a Beautiful Place so I'm No Longer Afraid to Die's first album, Whenever If Ever, that mm-hmm. really makes me think of Yola Tango. I bet you probably know what it is too. And it's Low Light Assembly, which is like my favorite deep cut on that album. It evokes that exact same serenity that I think that band captured and also goes to show you how influential they are because I mean like they, they, they this is they, they had to know they had to know um but it, it's that same kind of like it's also kind of inherently sort of youthful and spirited like I always it always feels nostalgic listening to a Yola Tango album this is and this is no exception obviously mm. yeah yeah I'm, I'm trying not to repeat myself but I keep thinking of like things that I uh, feelings or thoughts that I've had like how every time I listen to this album and it gets to center of gravity which is the bossa nova song buried in the deep cut second half of this album it feels like the end credits are rolling on my life and it's like that, a kind of sprightly sort of song after this continued sort of mellow se- sequence from Green Arrow through the line, how we told it. And then this kind of like sprightly little bossa nova beat comes in with these really kind of like, um, uh, I can't tell if it's flamenco guitars or what it is, but it just comes in and it's like this little perky little nugget of beauty that's hidden in the album. It has those ba ba I love those ba da ba vocals that Ira does like on multiple songs on this album. Uh, Moby Octopad's another one where he does them really great. And I just love like the little sense of like sunlight through the clouds that comes through when that song hits. Um, I, 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 it's, it's a more contentious track 
So I wouldn't be surprised if I'm the only person who really enjoys it. But I love the kind of like hypnotic kraut rock vibes of Spec Bebop. Like it's a really lengthy sort of noise jam and it kind of iterates itself, but it has this hypnotic quality to it. A big part of that, I think, is the drumming as well. But I love like the manipulations of feedback texture as that song sort of like rolls and rolls and rolls over. Like there's been so many times where I put this album on and, and just during this lengthy kind of very dissonant noise kraut rock jam, I just kind of like lose all awareness of my sensory surroundings and I feel like I can see the sounds in the song which is very difficult to explain what that's like but yeah and and so those jammier elements like I think that's an influence that I haven't really emphasized yet that would also explain why August maybe responds to this music the way he does is that there's a clear kraut rock and like 70s experimental rock influence on the jammier parts of this record, like Moby Octopad as well, like the drum motif. Whenever you have cycling repetitive drum motifs, that's very noisy to me. And I think you get a bit of that on some of those tracks like um, Moby Octopad and Deeper Into Movies and Spec Bebop. I think that the moments where this album kind of crests into gorgeous guitar beauty, like We're an American Band, which is just fucking so beautiful i love the way that it transitions out of spec bebop as well into this kind of tranquil place where this fucking like fiery guitar solo just comes in after the song is built up through the vocals like that solo and we're an american band is just fucking mind melting man i i i, I adore that so much and if the reason it hits so hard is it feels like this kind of culmination point, like it's, it feels really earned. It feels like you've been on a journey with this album through all of these different locations, some of which you might not have enjoyed as much as others. But then you arrive home with We're an American Band with this beautiful sort of guitar solo jam. And it's like, it's so satisfying. It's such a sense of finality to it. And it doesn't even matter, it doesn't hurt that that it's not even the last song on the album because then you have a beautiful little cover of an actual 60s song called My Little Corner of the World that just ends this album. And it's a beautiful little two minute, you know, 60s pop song that's just Georgia and this little kind of lopy guitar part. And it's so like comforting and warm and uh, it had radiates that kind of friendly positive energy that so much of this album has, even in its melancholy. And it's like, she's so underrated as like a, a singer as well. Like she's not like got pipes or anything. She has this very soft, almost whispery voice, but like her solo turns on this album, songs like um, Center of Gravity, but particularly like My Little Corner of the World and Shadows, where she's just singing. Like, I mean, I want to, I, I want to like be her friend. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I, I just like, especially when she's singing Shadows, like that song is so fucking emotional to me. Like, I wait in the shadows. I don't mind the shadows. Like that shit just fucking, it's like, ah, uh, tears on my diary. Like, fuck. Hey girl, you want to be friends? Like that, that song, that song Shadows feels like it kind of invented every sad girl singer songwriter of the 2000s and 2010s ever and it's just this little plaintive two-minute ballad about enjoying being alone while a solitary guitar line supports you and and then there's like what i love is how this album continually surprises you in, in different ways as well like when you get to stockholm syndrome which is another of my favorite songs ever the fact that that's actually sung by james mcnew the bassist not ira or georgia it's his first time singing i think and like the, the decision to just give him that song as opposed to just having ira or georgia sing it it's so smart because he doesn't have as memorable or as versatile a voice as the other two but he sings that song with just the right amount of like devastating longing in his voice you know, the way he just sings i know it makes me cry i do believe in love and that <laughs> i'm fucking blubbering and it's like it's because his voice is so perfect for that longingness that that song has and that i already mentioned it but that little guitar solo that happens halfway right through that song just rips me apart like and yeah ultimately at the end of the day i think 
it's a kind of record where you're going to be able to get into it. You're going to be able to relate to it. You're going to be able to like find a, a friendship or a kinship in it, or you're not. And that's fine. That's perfectly okay. Like it's not a record that it doesn't matter too much. And I think one thing that Jake, you've demonstrated as well as anyone is that if that's the case, then there might just be another Yola Tingo record that is more for you than this one. Certainly it's like a grab bag and structure. But I think if you're able to get into that mindset or if you're able to like feel that kinship with Ira, Georgia and James on this album, then it become, it'll just attach itself to you and it'll become like a part of your personality and a part of your life and a part of, you know, a comfort album or a comfort thing that nothing else can quite match exactly. And my I guess biggest goal with this whole conversation and with this video is that it will inspire people to kind of like consider when they experience this album like like experiencing it in a way where it kind of like heightens your sensory awareness of the world around you and just like soundtracks your life for a while like don't approach it necessarily with an analytical mindset. Don't put it on thinking, okay, I'm going to focus and listen to every detail and, and absorb it. Just experience this album. Treat it like an ambient record to a certain extent. Put it on while you're doing homework. Put it on while you're writing. Put it on while you're going for a walk. Put it on while you're lying down. Don't feel like you need to pick it apart for all of its details. You can enjoy those details as they become, as you become aware of them while the album is existing in front of you but like let it exist for a while and and I think that's the the key to this band in particular but this album too is it'll get under your skin or it might not but I think for most people and for me at least I can speak from my experience there's an immediate connection to the emotions and to the tones that I enjoy but there's a deeper emotional resonance that can only come with time and like like with any good friendship where the emotional connection gets deeper the more that you know each other that's almost the way that I treat this album and that might be the lamest thing I've ever said on this podcast so I'm going to stop there we're, we're a bunch of lame fucks the cd is my friend <laughs> <laughs> I take this vinyl in the bed and I give it a kiss yeah hug my hug my copy anyway morgan what was your experience like with this record and what are you what are your thoughts i don't really have very many i think it's a very good album i don't have much to say about it is as you were saying it's almost like an ambient album and if you don't connect to it which i didn't really i just admired it in its own way there's not really much to report on. I will say, Tyler, uh, I think you have succeeded in your goal because the one thing I want to do at this very moment is go listen to And Then Nothing. Yeah. With good headphones. Yeah. Big headphones. Yeah. Yeah, that's... That's... That's this fucking... That, that, that album and me, we go back. <laughs> we, we, we had some times back in the day. I mean, I'm I I. Our way to fall might just be the best love song ever written by anyone. Prove me wrong, internet. I won't. One thing that I think is a little undersold on here are the two covers: "My Little Corner of the World" and "Little Honda." One's a Beach Boys oh. cover. Yeah, I I think they're quite cute, fun covers and especially in my little corner of the world i think that's just such a, a nice quaint way to close the record after you've been just you, you've had the proverbial rock smashed against your head like yeah for 65 minutes straight at that point and sorry it's, it's just a really sweet song to end the record out on and i i quite like like that moment even if it is i think far from the most technically impressive on here there's something about the 
the elemental simplicity of, of moments like that, which this band is really able to sell, really able to tie together. And, and that's what I just admire about Yola Tango, that they're a band who, who make it work, even if it's something that's simple, like that melody on Return to Hot Chicken, which I could just... Oh. listen to for hours on end uh, literally or... literally if someone made like a 10 hour loop of that on youtube i would unironically just put that on and get on with my day and not turn it off it's it's so good any songs that you like that haven't really that you haven't had a chance to kind of talk about yet i guess the one i really want to get to is green arrow because that's my favorite song on here and it, it's one where no matter where you are in your experience with this band, there, there will be one point when you're listening to this album and, and the crickets aren't coming from the song and you won't realize They're coming it. from inside the house. <laughs> yeah. No, but they're, they're coming from the, the nature around you, the ambience around you. Uh, and I, and I think, yeah, that, that kind of, connection between this like urbanized forestry area as, as kind of jake you put it is that that's the song where that just speaks most powerfully to me and it's just i don't know it's a tough album to describe why it it works so well as you've made the point of tyler that it's by my my floundering words yeah sounds be warm and pretty yeah, I, I think I've basically touched on everything. I, I, I will mention with regard to the covers, I'm glad you reminded me about that. I've always, it's been a bit of a grower for me, but I've always admired like just the idea of taking a, a 60s, like early 60s Beach Boys song, like Little Honda and covering it and just turning it into a fucking noise rock song. Like, like that, that, that to me, the concept of that is just really funny. And it's very speaks, it speaks yeah. to the sense of humor that this band actually has as well. That's also kind of a bit, undervalued to some extent although to be fair they're not like you know they're not super irreverent or anything but they do have a sense of humor about themselves yeah great fucking album great fucking band uh total fucking trip love it to bits it will always be a part of my childhood and i'll never be able to escape it being a part of me so yeah fucking fuck man 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 oh man oh man fucking right. man Fuck a man, I could. Yeah. Fuck a man. Well, uh, no, that's my favorite song on Slint Spiderland. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Me and the homies. All right. Good shit. Favorite tracks and ratings: Yola Tango. I can hear the heart beating as one. Jake, why don't you go first? Uh, my three favorite tracks are going to be Damage, Green Arrow, and Shadows. Least favorite is, uh, I just kind of skipped over this because I found it would be ultimately kind of a fruitless thing to talk about, but let's just say that if um, Spec Bebop wasn't on this album, I'd like it more. <laughs> it's it's You're- just... It's that's long. that that is the prevailing opinion jake i've yes. heard it i've heard it a million times don't be coy about it's, saying it's, it is it's just it's this 10 minute long song album's already long i give it uh, an eight out of ten sick i was expecting a seven so that's fucking dope i'll take an eight august what's up uh <laughs> fuck <the> you. sky <laughs> Uh, okay, favorite did, song. Did you, song. did you really just... This man just <laughs> skied me. <laughs> in in the year of our Lord, what a, what 2021 a... Anno Domini. So favorites here, <laughs> Sugar Cube, Green Arrow, and I'll say We're an American Band, because that yeah. song fucking rocks. Uh, least favorite. Yeah, gotta go with Spec Bebop. I... As much as I like this album, it'd be better if it wasn't here, I think. And my f- rating is uh, shit, seven oh. and a half. Seven oh. and a half. Okay. 
the well, rare. So you know what time. though? At least the there there will be two things uh, this channel talks about with the name Bebop in it. And Spec Bebop is definitely going to be the better thing of the two. Three favorites are uh, Green Arrow, Damage, and uh, I'll say we're an American band. I like that song a good bit. My least favorite is also Spec Bebop for the reasons previously listed. Uh, and I will also give this a seven and a half. Oh, sick. I mean, I'll take this. This is sick. Um, well, you have no choice. No, I know I don't have a choice. I just, <laughs> if I had to pick three favorite songs on this album, which is stupid, but let's just do it for an exercise because that's what we do on this podcast. If I had to pick my three favorite songs on this album, um, Actually, since it's my record, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to pick the three most underrated songs on this album just for fun because they won't have overlap. Um, I'm a pretty basic bitch. Sugar Cube, Green Arrow, and Stockholm Syndrome are my three favorites on this album. Although special shout out to Autumn Sweater, which is deservingly, I believe, the most popular Yola Tingo song. But the three most underrated songs on this record is a simply a three-song sequence, and that is 1 p.m. again, The Lion How We Told It, and Center of Gravity, which is a fantastic run of really minimal and beautiful songs that no one ever talks about, and I love them all. And this album is, of course, getting a 5 out of 10. I'm just kidding. It's getting a 10 out of 10. Wow, that actually you got me there. <laughs> no, I was, it wouldn't have been funny if I didn't sound like I meant it. Um, anyway... <laughs> Yeah, 10. So that gives us an average of 8.3, which I will take. <laughs> Yo, la 10, go. <laughs> Thank you for sticking with me through this video and through this series of record clubs on albums that have defined my childhood, some of which have resonated more with this podcast than others. It's still been really rewarding. I'm now going to go back to recommending albums I love, but I also think will purely just be great conversationally. And um, next week on Record Club, we're going to be talking about Sophie's Oil of Every Pearl's Uninsides, which is Jacob. Jacob, fuck. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my, like, you said that and just, it, it took up, like, less than a second for my asshole to fully clinch. Sorry. Jake's <laughs> favorite, not favorite, Jake's recommended album, <laughs> fucking words, what do they mean? Um, we're going to talk about How that. Work? And, Jake's um, favorite Sophie album. I mean, we, we have to have a designated time each month where I can cry like a baby on this podcast. And I managed to not do it today. So it's going to be when we talk about Sophie uh, next week. Yep. And that's just going to be that. My face, the front of the shop. Yeah, my, my, my face. Uh, mm. Make sure if you enjoyed the video, you give it a like and subscribe if you have not already. Let us know in the comments what you think of this album. What's your favorite Yola Tingo album, if not this one? What's your relationship with Yola Tingo's music? We want to hear from you in the comments below. As I said, next week, we will be back with a new record club on Sophie's Oil of Every Pearl's Uninsides. So stick around for that. Make sure you go and check out our main episode this week where we discuss the new albums from Adili and Converge and Chelsea Wolfe. And we'll be back next week with new reviews of Cynic and something else that we have to decide on what it's going to be. But it's going to be something good, probably, hopefully, the Paranormal album, but maybe, maybe not if we can find something better. August, why don't you send us out? A daily stand. Like a steely day. As always, folks. Rock over London. Uh, rock on Chicago. Honda. From Honda. Uh, 